Well, it's going to be a good one. Well, I'm really excited to be here tonight. You guys are all so spread out. It's kind of, I don't know, kind of weird. It feels strange. But you know what? It's okay. Um, you know, it's kind of crazy what's going on right now, yeah? Anybody have an Instagram? Anybody know what I'm talking about at all? Like, we read the Old Testament, and all of a sudden, like, plagues don't sound all that bad, you know? Like, <laughs> with what's going on in our cities and in our country and all these ideas and philosophies and crazy stuff that people are talking about. And I know that a lot of people have been moved by this. Um, living maybe in fear, maybe living in a place to where because of all this stuff that's going on, you're kind of freaking out. Being like, man, what's going to happen with our country? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen in general? And I just have a, this is not part of the message or anything. Um, I guess it is since I'm sharing it. <laughs> but I want to encourage you. If you're shaken because of what's going on around you, what's your foundation? Like, just seriously, just check yourself. Like, and this is a moment, like, I want, I want us to maybe search our hearts. I know that things are going around and it's kind of crazy. Like, literally, this whole 2020 is craziest year and everybody's like, this is the worst month so far. You know, it's like, dang, how much worse can it get? And then next month, it's actually worse. And if it's worse for everyone else, should it be worse for us? I think it's really interesting that we're really good at quoting scripture and stuff and all this good stuff inside church, but whenever things come push to shove, it's a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit more difficult to have a high, uh, I don't know, like a high attitude, a good attitude whenever things literally are going crazy in our city. It's a little more difficult whenever maybe you're having an argument and then you see all this stuff and then everything else that's going on on top of things, you know, the, the hair that broke the camel's back. And it's like, man, things are crazy. Lord, we need you so much. And guys, he's here. He never left us. He never is going to leave us. And I love what Lana said. He fights our battles for us. Like, come on, it doesn't get much better than that. You don't have to do anything. You just have to have faith. Have faith in him. Have faith in his finished work. And like, it's a really good, honestly, as bad as it sounds, everything that's going on is a good place for you to check yourself. Of like, man, if I'm freaking out, why? Because if you know who your rock is, you wouldn't be freaking out. You wouldn't be shaken by this. And so if you are, I wanna just, let's just pray actually. You know what, can we just stand up for a second? I want to pray for our city, pray for our country, pray against fear, pray against this fear that's been crippling every single person, like literally people are freaking out. Guys, if the end of the world is actually at hand, it's good news for us Christians. That means we got to go spend time with the Father forever and ever. And I don't know about you, but I know where I'm going, so I'm not concerned, okay? So let's just pray together. God, we just thank you so much, Lord that you did not lose your power, Lord. You know exactly what you're doing, God. And perhaps we were made for such a time as this, God, when everything else is going to hell, God, when the city is in darkness, God, maybe light can shine brighter, Father. I just pray in the name of Jesus for every single person, every single believer, God, that has had just this fear, this darkness fill their hearts, this darkness fill their minds, God. I cast that out into the, just the hell, God. We believe in you, God. We believe that you have not left us, God. And we bless our country, God. We bless our city, God. We just pray for your peace to come down, God. Not to choose a side between Christians, who's right, who's wrong, God. But to choose you, Jesus. To choose to love, God. To choose to be in you, Father God. I just pray right now, God, for every single believer, God. Every single person, even that's not a believer, God. That just had this fear, this dark cloud upon them, God. I just pray, God, that you send the light, God. You show them who you are, Father. You have not left us like or you have not abandoned us, God. And I thank you so much, Jesus, that you're in this place tonight, God. We worship you, Lord. We thank you, God. And we bless our city, God. We just pray for your grace, God, your grace to come down, God. We pray, God, for your grace to come all over America, God, for the world, God, the things that are going on now, God. We just pray that the church will rise up all the more, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Okay, so I've almost stole my sermon, but you know that's how you're in the same spirit, I hope. Maybe we're both wrong. <laughs> God, just kidding. <laughs> okay, if you want to read with me, we're going to be reading out of Genesis. Um, we're going to be reading out of Genesis chapter 18. So pretext, I'm going to be talking about Abraham um, this is probably not going to be anything new to you. 
And I think that we don't always need something new. There was this quote that I heard that kind of scared me a little bit. It's like, the scary thing about sonship and like knowing who Christ is, is the language is easily adaptable. So a lot of us, we can maybe talk the church talk, but in your hearts, you know where you are with God. And it's scary that we can talk church talk like, and have it make it sound so good. But if it's not personal to you, it has no effect in you. And so I want to challenge us tonight. Don't look just, maybe God will give you a brand new revelation through what I'm saying. But I don't think that I'm going to tell you something new. But I want you to apply what we're going to hear. I know a lot of us, we will love deeper revelations and it's great. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But I'm saying sometimes the simplest thing is all you need. And if you actually obey the simplest thing, you're going to do so much more with that obedience than with the head knowledge of just knowing deeper revelation. Come on, there's just so many Christians that claim they know everything. And maybe they do, but then their relationships between even their parents, within one another, how they treat one another, what they talk about. Like, those are things that matter. If you know him, that's going to affect your life. So uh, we're going to be reading about Abraham, but the story that we're going to be focusing on is actually not Abraham. It's going to be a hero of mine, Sarah. Come on, somebody said, come on. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Come on, ladies. Sarah, my hero. Okay, hallelujah. God used this woman in the Bible. Come on, all those girls. Never mind. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go that route right now. You know who you are. <laughs> I've said enough. Okay, well, we're going to, so a little bit of backstory. Um, so Abraham, old man. In fact, he's very old. And Sarah, his wife, who happens to also be his stepsister, it's Old Testament stuff, you all need to relax, okay? Um, she can't have kids. And in Old Testament, especially in that time, a woman's primary thing to do was to bear sons. It's a huge deal. In fact, it's such a big deal. If you cannot do that, you're living almost under a curse. People would think you're either cursed, there's something wrong with you, and Quite literally, God actually did curse certain people, like people groups, actually what Eva was talking about. The two cities he went to, Egypt was one of them, and I forget the name of the second one. But they actually, God closed the wombs of all the women, and they weren't able to bear until Abraham basically confessed that that was his uh, sister. So Abraham is living over here, and Sarah's too old to have kids, and she's living with this. I want you to understand that she's already old, okay? So, like, bear with me for a second. She's old. She's lived this life where she cannot have a kid for her husband. This is a big deal. This is something that you're living with every day. This, in fact, I would say would become a part of her identity, of who you are. You're Sarah. You're Abraham's wife. You have inheritance so much. He's probably one of the most wealthiest people, but you can't give him a son. And you think that people didn't talk about this? I'm sure for a fact she was at the well and like, oh, look, there's Sarah. She can't have any kids. And it became an identity. It became something that would be with her. It became something that would, wherever she would go, this thing would follow, this problem. And so we're going to read in Genesis chapter 18. We're going to read from verse 3. And so Abraham is in the desert, and these three men are approaching him. And one of them is, well, basically it's God. God is approaching him. And in verse 3, we read, and so to these men, Abraham runs out. He bows down low to the ground, and he said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and then you may wash your feet and rest under the tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed, and then you may go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they said. Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seals. Get three seeds of the finest flour and knead them and bake bread. Then he ran, and, uh, ran to the herd and uh, selected a choice of tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought out some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared. And he set these before him. While they ate, he stood near under the tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked. There she is in the tent. So scene is set. These guys are eating over here. Three of them, Abraham's chilling probably right in the middle of them. And then there's Sarah in the tent that just made the bread, right? And God, literally Abraham is hosting God. This is a big deal. This is crazy. Like literally imagine physically God is right there with him and he's giving him bread. He's like, he's giving him the finest of everything he can possibly give. He says, where's your wife Sarah, they asked. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. 
Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she, th as she thought, after I'm worn out and old, sorry, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why, is Sarah, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have children now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did. Can you imagine like lying to, the, to God right then? And he's like, yeah, no, you did. And like, you're, you're still trying to believe yourself. Sarah's supposed to have a child. This is an impossible situation, okay? Um, some people would say she's 89 years old. Typically, women go through menopause at, 20, at 55 years old. 20, I'm just kidding, not 20. <laughs> easy, easy. Maybe they're the Slavic culture, too. That's what they believe. But average age is 55 years old, right? So Sarah is what? That's 30-something years past that, 34 years past that. So this ain't happening, basically, is what I'm saying. Like, it's impossible for this to happen. And meanwhile, God already gave Abraham this promise of having generations, basically saying, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars, right? That means you have to have a son. And so prior to them coming, actually, what Sarah did was saying, hey, Abraham, I want you to fulfill what God has promised you. And obviously, it's not going to be through me. I'm old. Take my uh, servant, Hagar, sleep with her. Maybe she'll give you a son. And that way, you'll be able to succeed in God's promise. God said something towards Abraham. It's interesting. That this is so ironic. Abraham, the father of faith, right? His wife does not have faith that God can use her womb to give Abraham a son. Think about that. Abraham is so obedient to God in every single way. And he, not only does he talk the talk, he walks the walk. And now Sarah is saying, hey, Abraham, God is real for sure. He has this promise for you. But Hagar is the one that's going to have the son for you. And so Abraham does what his wife says. He has a son. And so his son is already, I don't remember, he's like 13 years old already here or 12 years old. So years have passed. And now these men come and say, you're going to have a son. Like, just think about the mental like, state that Sarah would have to be in. She's already been thinking that she's been doing what God has promised for these last 13 years. And imagine this resentment almost that would go, come upon Hagar. What this slave girl can have, the master cannot. Sarah would do anything, I can imagine, to have a child. But the slave girl, young, obviously is young enough to have children. It's just like whatever. And you keep on going. And for something that would be, even how she says, well, I have this pleasure to give my master a son. And I can totally see where Sarah's coming from. I don't know how your life has been going, if everything is just dandelions and roses, but most of the time there are certain things that you're like, man, God, you promised us this thing, but I guess Hagar's gonna have to do. There, you promised us a generation. You promised us all of these. Uh, you promised me that I'm going to have this life. You have, the, you have these things that I want to do in my life. You gave me vision. You gave me, you gave me dreams. You gave me passion. You gave me gifts. And at one point in my life, I believed them, God. But now that so much time has passed and they're not coming to, for, to fulfillment, I don't know if this, this is it. And probably you need a hand, so I'm going to try to settle for something less. And so, Abraham... Just hosted God. God is telling him, listen, this time next year, surely you will have a son. In Genesis chapter 21, we're going to skip a chapter. Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. And we're not going to be long, just so we're clear here. I want to give you guys an opportunity to just have communion with the Lord. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God promised him. Abraham gave birth to Isaac. I'm oh, sorry, Abraham gave the name Isaac. I know, right? That's weird. That's why it's really important to say the right words. Um, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac, when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter 
And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have thought, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in my old age. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham, and him mock, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for the woman's son will never share the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. So I read that, and I started, remember, saying that Sarah's one of my heroes. That does not sound like hero talk. Send this woman out of here. Get her out of here. This woman that just has a child, I want her gone. And then I began to think about it. I began to think about why would Sarah have said that? Why would she think that it would be a good decision for Abraham to send out his, I guess, second wife now and the child out of here? And I started becoming, well, started thinking more and more, and I'm thinking about it, and no one knew what Sarah had to go through. No one was there when she would cry every single night because she can't have a son. She can't fulfill the promise that God has called for her. And now that she has a son, now that all of these heartaches have passed by, all of these things that every single look that somebody could have given her, every single just whisper, every single everything, nobody went through that and nobody knows how dear her promise is to her. So she's saying, there's no way I'm gonna give what God promised to Abraham to this son. I'm not gonna settle for anything less than what God has promised me through Isaac. I'm not gonna settle for less than what God has promised me and I'm gonna go for it. See, maybe there's certain areas in your life where you're saying, God, I believe in this, and you did believe in it for a season. But now that that season is gone, and you're like, man, this thing didn't come to fulfillment, I don't know if this is actually going to happen, God. Guys, I want to encourage you. Remember the promise that God has promised you. Don't settle for Ishmael. There's an Isaac in your life. There's something that God has promised you, and he's going to fulfill it. There's something that God has promised you and he's gonna come through with it. And sometimes it's a lot easier to just make up your own way to try to achieve what God has because it's easier that way and it requires less faith. Faith is something that is, you can't see it. It's so hard to explain. But yet when you have it, you know it. And when you don't have it, you also know it. I wanna encourage you guys tonight. The faith that Sarah had to defend her promise because it's so dear to her that she thought it was worth sending her out. Maybe it's not the nicest thing that she could have done, but she's saying, I'm not going to let him have this inheritance. What is sharing the inheritance with the promise that God has promised you? Many of us, we claim, and check this out. What about the promises you promised God? All, most of us were baptized here, and we're, we're, we swore, and we're saying, hey, God, I promise I'm going to serve you with a good heart and a clean conscience. Those are some serious words to say, you know? And what's worse is this. Sarah was pregnant, right? And she had faith and she was pregnant with the promise that God said, hey, listen, you're going to have a son. And so she was faithful with that son even at the very end when finally Isaac was born. She's like, man, maybe I slipped up at first and I let Hagar do what she did, but I wasn't faithful then. But God, now I want to be faithful because your promises are greater. But check it out. A lot of people, they're not pregnant with the promise that God has for them. They're pregnant with an opinion of their neighbor. If they see me and think I'm good, then I must be good. If he sees me and he says, wow, you can really sing. I must be a good singer. If God really loves me, then other people would say, man, you have this gift. Oh, man, I just shared and no one said I'm good. I just sang and no one said, oh, wow, you did such a good job. Guys, we're pregnant with opinions of people that are going to change every single day. Whenever you're supposed to be just focused, laser focused on what God has for you, the faith that requires just to say, God, even though it's not right now, I'm still going to stand in your promise. I'm still going to stand in your word. That one went far. Sorry. Front row, you're getting baptized today. In the name of the Father, the Son. <laughs> no. But I want to encourage you guys tonight. What do you believe in? Here's the crazy part. This is where, like, I love how the Old Testament 
is intertwined with the New Testament. Abraham, the father of faith, has Sarah who cannot have children. He said, God didn't just say you're going to have a child. He said, I'm going to make nations out of you, right? So let's just, I just want you guys to see how impossibly impossible this whole scenario is. Abraham's old, Sarah's old. He's promised not only a child, but a nation through a woman that can't have children. And not only that, the promise is not actually just the nation. The promise is the Messiah. An impossible situation for the Messiah to start with, the father of faith, also actually happens to be the start of his life when Mary can't conceive because she's not had a man and she's conceived with a child. There is a promise that was promised to Sarah that was far greater than just a nation. There was a promise that was promised to Sarah that was far greater than just a child. There was a promise through Abraham, through Sarah, of a Messiah that's going to come and give us hope, give us faith, give us more than we can possibly ever want. And we can be shifted based off what's going on in the world. Shifted, pregnant with the opinion of the media, listening to too much of that. What you fool yourself, fill yourself with, obviously is going to become a reality. So I'm asking you, are you filled with him? Are you filled with faith? Are you filled with the promise of God? Can you see Jesus in what you're doing and say, God, I want to see you more and more in my life. I'm not going to settle for less. I'm not going to settle for less. Not only because it's not what you said, but because there's more to it than I will ever understand. Can you understand how, well, I don't think we'll ever fully understand, but the impossibility of what happened and the God's plan just for us to even have moments like this, nights like this, to be the light in the darkness. I want to encourage us and challenge us. What's the promise that God has given you? I believe there's two types of promises, right? So the first promise is individually, like, man, I feel like, I, well, not feel like, I know that I need to go to the, the missions. I'm called to go to do this, to do this. How you're effective in the body. But there's also the promise of the Messiah. And in the Messiah comes inheritance of son and daughter. So there's so many promises that God has available for you, but what are you holding on to? I'm not gonna try to tell you something new, something that maybe is gonna mind blow you, like, wow, man, I finally get it. There's the revelation I've been waiting for. I'm actually going to start reading my Bible or I'm actually going to start changing. In fact, I'd say that change is one of those things that are probably the most difficult. I'm talking about your change of nature. We see Sarah, two different Sarahs here. The first Sarah before this promise, she was trying to do anything she can just to fulfill a promise. But the second Sarah was keeping her promise. Are you guys keeping your promise? Or are you trying to make something happen to make it look like it's the promise? And I want to, actually, we're going to all stand. <clears throat> I want to ask you tonight, what are you standing for? Not like right now physically, because <laughs> I told you to stand up. But in your heart of hearts, what are you believing for? I don't know about you, but it would be pretty difficult. She's 89 years old, guys. I don't know if you've seen any 89-year-olds, but I don't know. I, the last thing I think about is, man, you should have a child. This is a good idea. But yet, here's Sarah in her old age, and she says, well, I have this pleasure. A promise that seemed, from any angle, too good to be true. And the promise that we received is not too good to be true. The promise that we received, each and every single one of us, should you choose to remain in it, is not too good to be true. Man, I just want to have some of you guys just lift up your heads because you've been so downcast. The enemy has had you right where he's wanted you. And you're not even believing, you have a hard time believing for yourself that God is even wanting you. Am I even a Christian? If I'm a Christian, then why would this and this happen? And all these things that could be just pushing down upon you, especially in this hard time. Now that we don't have, well, now we can gather, but now that we didn't gather for such a long time. I want to ask you, what are you dependent on? The opinions of people or what God has spoken to you? Does the pastor have to come up to you and say, 
listen, God wants to use you. He's going to speak through you. He's going to have people get saved through you. And then you're like, wow, that guy said something to me. Now I can go out and do what he said me to do. Yo, read your Bible and there's going to be a lot more that's promised to you than just some pastor laying his hands on you. I want to challenge your faith. I want to just have our faith erupt. Faith that'll change our nation is actually really cool. The other day I was in downtown Vancouver and I saw a bunch of Christians gathering at that monument, the little pen looking thing. And they were praying and worshiping. And I'm like, dude, how cool is that? Like the city is out there doing one thing down in Portland and we're out here, we can pray, worship and try to do something so much better. So much better than just ourselves. So much better than just inside these walls. Like I really believe that God has ideas here that require you, that require you. It's not just like God will find someone else. They require you, your obedience for God to just impact those people he wants to impact through your life. What about the promises to the nations? What about the promises, man, all of us Christians, we have these Christian lingos of seasons. Man, I'm going through this season and this is difficult and like that was this season, now it's changing. And it's like as if our whole entire understanding of what it is to be a Christian changes based off the season we're in. Don't get me wrong, it's not always easy, but I, I never promised an easy life. He's my comforter, yes, but that doesn't mean that there's gonna be situations that are difficult. And again, what are you believing for tonight? Like, ch check yourself. This is gonna be one of those times where it's between you and God. You're Sarah in the tent, God's right here. And he's saying, hey, I, I said to you, you're gonna be having a school club, prayer club. And you're like, what? I'm not gonna have a school prayer club. I said to you, your family's gonna get saved because you're gonna pray them through. No, God, you didn't say that. Yes, I did. I want us to just remember where God has taken us from. Man, we all have these moments in our life. I believe most Christians, they have these moments where they've encountered God so strongly and they call it a Christian high or a Christian experience. But that's a moment where you face to face with God, where he's speaking into your life. Has something else taken the place of what he spoke to you? Holy Spirit, I thank you so much that you're here right now. God, for every single person here, God, that has maybe walked astray, God. God, that has allowed things to come into their life that should not be there. Holy Spirit, I thank you that your goodness is here, that your grace is here to allow us an opportunity just to set our hearts straight towards you, God to allow us to give us another moment to spend some time with you, Father, and to be reminded of the things that you've spoken into our hearts, the things that you've spoken into our, just into our families, into our church, God. Holy Spirit, I pray, God, that we not settle for anything less than what you've promised us, God. Holy Spirit, I pray, God, that we be able to apply the simple gospel into our lives, not just go into a deep theology or a deep revelation, but something that'll impact our lives, Lord. God, a face-to-face -face with you, Father. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much that you're in this place right now, God. And every single person, Lord, that is in this place that needs to come before you, Father, and say, man, these are certain things that I've allowed in my life. They're not part of the promise that God has for me. I need to lay them down, Father. I just pray their heart be in a position to where they can actually lay them down. Not just say it, God, but be in a position to where they can lay them down and not look back because the cross is worth it, God. To know you is worth it, God. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're in this place right now, God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Come on, he's in this place right now, right here. You don't got to go far. You don't have to have just some pastor come up and pray for you. The promise is he wants to speak to you. He can remind them of you. Just ask him, Lord, where do you want me to go, Father? What are the promises that you have for me that maybe I've set aside, God, or I've been settling for less, making excuses? God, I thank you so much, God, that this room is filled with world changers, God. People that are going to shift culture. They're not going to bow down, God, just to culture and everything else that's going on, God. But they're going to stand firm upon your word, Lord. They're going to have a backbone, God.
Spirit wants to just minister to some of you guys right now in this moment. Maybe you've forgotten why you're here, why you're even a Christian. Maybe you've forgotten the reason for everything. You've forgotten the reason, but he just wants to remind you he's here right now. Come on, the King of Kings is here right now. Don't waste your opportunity. We can leave tonight and miss Jesus. We can leave tonight, sing some karaoke, just listen to some, somebody say some stuff and miss him altogether. Don't miss your opportunity with God. Don't miss your opportunity with God. Come on, I want to also invite you, if, if you feel like you want prayer with someone, someone to just stand in the gap with you, just come on up. We're going to have one of our leaders pray with you. If you're going through a dark season, the enemy will say that, hey, you can do it on your own. You can go through it by yourself. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to be by yourself. There's plenty of people. Yes, there's God, but there's also loving believers that want to stand right there next to you. And come on, right now is a dark time in our country. And if you need somebody to stand by, you wouldn't be the only one. God, I just pray right now for a compassionate heart, God, for us just to have love towards one another, God. For us to have love towards one another, God. For every single person that might be hurting, God, or going through something in their lives, God, that just feels like it's too much to bear, God. It's enough to bear for you, God. You have not left us like orphans, God. You have not abandoned us, Lord, not for a minute. Maybe our focus has changed off of you, Lord, but you have not left your focus off of us, God. We worship you, King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords, God.